hey, turn that thing up. So, Philip, you spoke recently in Canada on behalf of Effect Hope, which is a charity that works and addresses diseases like leprosy. Mm -hmm. I'd like us to start there, especially for the benefit of Effect Hope, who worked so hard to bring you to Canada, Mm -hmm. and just ask you, why is that work so important to you? I'd have to go way back to fully answer that question because I was raised without a father. My father died when I was one year old. He died of polio, which was uh, un- well, it was a pandemic for sure, but usually it, it affected children. And he was 23 years old. And I tell the story in my memoir where the light fell of people who became convinced that he would be healed because he was planning to be a missionary to Africa and was a dynamic young man. And why would God possibly take a person like that in, in, in his prime? So they actually had him removed against all medical advice from the iron lung that was keeping him alive by breathing for him. And he showed slight signs of possible recovery for a few days, but nine days later he died. And so uh, my mother never remarried. We were raised in poverty uh, in a little trailer home. It just affected my life from that point on. And then years later, I started writing books. My very first book was a book called Where Is God When It Hurts? And in the process of writing that book, I came across a man named Dr. Paul Brand, who was a leprosy specialist. And he's the one who established for all time that almost all of the abuse that you see, that you associate with leprosy, comes before, uh, or he is the person who established for all time that virtually all of the abuse, the disfiguration that you associate with leprosy comes because leprosy patients don't feel pain. For example, this is an easy example. We blink every few seconds, 28,000 times a day, they they tell us. And the reason we blink is because our eyes need that lubrication and there's a little pain cell. And if you force yourself to keep your eyes open, you will feel excruciating pain within a couple of minutes. It forces you to blink and that's a good thing. Well, people with leprosy lose that neurosensitivity. They don't blink and they go blind simply because they don't blink. And Dr. Brand uh, struck me as I was writing my book because he he talked about pain as a gift. In fact, he said if there was one gift I could give to my leprosy patients, it would be the gift of pain. And I called him up out of the blue. I was so struck by his thoughts that uh, I asked him, could I fly down to your laboratory in Louisiana and interview you? And that started a 10 year relationship. We were kind of an odd couple. I I was in my twenties. This was the uh, kind of post hippie era era, and my hair was out to, well, it looked like Art Garfunkel. I took (laughs) took a picture of Art Garfunkel to my I have heard that comparison before. (laughs) (laughs) And said, can you make me like that? And they said, yeah, we'll just cut it all the same length. And it just kept growing. And Dr. Rand was a British, uh, silver-haired, uh, very distinguished man who spent most of his life in India. So we were an odd couple, but over the years, he became a father figure for me. Uh, and it, it was so helpful to my faith because growing up in a, in a rather toxic church background, I had quite a bit of recovery to do. And there was nothing better than for God to put me in close intimate contact with a man who was a a giant of faith in every way. And I followed him around the world for 10 years, wrote his books, Fearfully and Wonderfully Made in His Image and the Gift of Pain. And that gave a, a, a cocoon period for me to let my own faith develop in light of his. And I later decided, you know, there's something... There's something to be said for choosing your own father. (laughs) I I grew up without a father, but then when I was an adult, I said, uh, I like this guy. And we didn't have to go through all that individuation and rebellious teenage periods and all that stuff, you know, because uh, uh, we weren't related and I was an adult by then. So that's a long answer to the question, but that got me involved in the disease leprosy and, uh, Other diseases like that, I think the phrase Mm -hmm. Effect Hope uses is neglected tropical diseases. And some of these have really easy cures and treatment. Others are not so easy. But because of uh, this, because of the way our our world is in much of the world, 
that treatment is not readily available apart from non-NGOs, mm -hmm. uh, ministries like Effect Hope that don't work through governments, but go truly in a servant, loving capacity and present healing and comfort to people who are in, in desperate straits. Yeah, it is such a nice overlay of your earlier work with mm -hmm. Dr. Brand. And I'm I'm sure you have a great impact by uh, speaking on behalf of Effect Hope and, and other charities like that. I do think of you as the um, pain and suffering guy. And also, <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, the author that people trust to ask and explore the really hard questions. Mm -hmm. And I think that, it, well, it is such, such a gift to the church. And I, I, I want our listeners to know that I forewarned Philip Yancey about some of the questions I'm about to ask because, and I think we have this in common, Philip, as writers, we appreciate the fact that the personal is always universal as well, that uh, our stories, our personal stories when shared, um, you know, with transparency can help other people as, and that we all share some of these really big, tough questions in common. Uh, so I have suffered a great loss in my life recently with the death of my husband at 59 after right. a very rare side effect of a kidney transplant. Uh, so my kids and I are walking through some deep waters and someone close to me uh, who wouldn't consider themselves religious uh, said something to me that really <laughs> like made me think. And it was, it's so great that you have your faith. And in mm. that moment, I didn't, it was a stumper for me. I didn't feel like, oh, yeah, I'm so relieved I have my faith. I, I almost felt like I have bigger questions because I have my faith. And right. it unearthed for me maybe some wrong thinking I had about when, when bad things happen. So I guess I'm wondering, um, when we talk about the physical pain leading to um, you know better outcomes and hope for, for physical illness, what does our emotional pain tell us about where we are and what we need? Hmm. That's a great question. I, I guess I would start by saying I've learned that all pain is pain. Mm. Uh, you know, we tend to kind of have an inner ranking. So when I'm talking about uh, people in, in uh, impoverished countries who have diseases like leprosy, I'm sure there are some people thinking, well, then I guess my pain doesn't matter. You know, I have arthritis or something like that, but I don't have leprosy. And it, it doesn't work that way. You, you can't rank on a scale. Okay, this is a higher pain. This is worth more or emotional pain is worth less than physical pain. I told you that my first book was a book called Where is God When It Hurts? And my second book kind of on my own came several years later, a number of years later, and that's a book called Disappointment with God. Yes. And I wrote that because so many people wrote to me and said, I read your book on on physical pain, and that's not really my issue. My issue is more like a sense of betrayal. Mm -hmm. uh, I trusted God. And, and then I was given a, a child with a, a birth defect that has changed my whole life or uh, you know, some chronic disease, and they would describe this, or, or they were in a terrible marriage, or, you know, just all the many things that can produce long-term discomfort and pain, whether emotional or physical. And one of the things I learned is that God welcomes our feeling of lament, really. Um, my mother, uh, was deeply affected by the fact that my father was not healed when people prayed, he died. But she didn't really have the kind of theology that allowed you to question God. And as I look back on it now, I, I wish she had spent more time reading the Lamentations in the Bible, you know, and there's a book by that name. And then a lot of the Psalms, a lot of the prophets, and certainly the book of Job, these are people who are upset with God, disappointed with God. When I first proposed that book, my publisher said, well, you know, Christian bookstores like books like uh, Christian Secret to a Happy Life, not Disappointment with God. Can we soften that title a little bit? And I said, no, because there are people out there who are really not only disappointed, they feel betrayed by God. And I want to speak to them. 
Oh, gosh. I, I guess yeah. one of the first things I would say, and it's uh, it's not really intuitive. Intuitively, when something bad happens, we tend to think God is punishing me or, you know, I did something wrong. I deserve this. And some religions would say that, but that's mm-hmm. karma. That's not grace. You know, yes. we, we get our best picture of what's going on in the invisible world through Jesus, because God mm-hmm. came to earth, we believe, God's son, and gave us a face. And if you want to know how God feels about people who are going through suffering, just follow Jesus around. Every time he was asked, he always responded with, with comfort and healing. He never said, well, you need to come back with more faith later, and then I'll talk to you. Or you need to have your theology straight first, no matter who it was, whether it was a widow who had just lost her only son, or even a Roman soldier, the occupying force in in Jesus' day, whose servant fell ill, ill, Jesus would respond with healing. And I guess I I would put it this way, and I mentioned this on the tour in in, uh, Toronto area, that God is always on the side of the one suffering. God is on the side of the one suffering. And the way I know that is following Jesus around. When Jesus was on earth, he was the best picture we have of of how God views this planet, what's going on here. And Jesus taught us to pray. Uh, he, he wanted the Father's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, that's, that's not happening. But he said, that's your job. I, I'm here just for a few years, and then I'm leaving. And then it's going to be up to you to represent that God of mercy and compassion and healing. The phrase I love is in uh, 2 Corinthians 1, Paul's phrase. He talks about the father of compassion, the God of all comfort. And I believe that's what we in the church are supposed to do. There are huge questions out there. Okay, why did God allow this kind of virus to occur? Why mm-hmm. why the leprosy bacillus? And nobody can answer those questions. Uh, God certainly didn't try in, in the book of Job. He just kind of shouted at him and said, <laughs> um, don't tell me how to run the universe until you can do what I do, you know? <laughs> and um, that didn't really solve Job's problems, but it, it reminded Job of, of his little limited perspective. He couldn't see what was going on in the rest of the universe. The best picture we have is the picture of Jesus. So when I go to a place like uh Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut, that terrible tragedy. We had one of the mass shootings where 20 six and seven year old children were killed by by a deranged gunman. And I spoke to those people. It's important for me to be able to say, you are grieving, God grieves more. Mm -hmm. You are upset with the way things are going on this earth. God is more upset and God promises to do something about it someday. He's doing it in kind of a slow, patient, painstaking way. And and that's so frustrating. We want God to do for us, in every case, what Jesus did when he was confronted with the person. Jesus could have presumably waved a magic wand and said, okay, everybody who has a virus in Israel, you're gonna be healed now. But that's not why he came, mm-hmm. evidently because he didn't do that. He did respond every time he was asked directly, but he didn't come to solve the problem of pain. He came to solve the problem of a rebellious planet. Okay. And that's a, that was a different agenda yes. than we may want. When you mentioned uh, God's comfort, um, I think as we were going through our darkest days, and people would say, you know, often like we say it to each other, may you feel God's comfort during this time. Mm. It's on every sympathy card practically. And yeah. I kept waiting for this magical comforting feeling mm. to descend upon me. I, I I think I thought that's how it worked. And that that was not my experience. And I have talked to other people in grief who have asked the same question, like, what does God's comfort actually feel like and look like? And what I think I concluded eventually, and I mean, I'm still trying to figure this stuff out, um, and I appreciate you saying that we never will to a certain extent, but that what I found comforting was 
the notion or the idea of Jesus suffering, that Jesus was the mm. suffering Messiah, that he wept, that and that comfort comes to God's people through God's people, I think. Um, I guess I'm wondering what you think of that. How do we experience God's comfort? What does it feel like? And did I miss the comfort boat? <laughs> mm, yeah. Anybody in grief studies will tell you it, it takes time. It mm -hmm. just takes not days, not months, but years, really. Um, and they chart out. You, you start to recover after something like a year and a half, two years before you can resume life <laughs> in any way kind of similar to what what happened before the tragedy. I think you're absolutely right that uh, that we, we are God's presence in the world right now. The phrase Paul uses is the body of Christ, which means Jesus had a body, but then Jesus left and said, now it's up to you guys. Go out and spread the good news around the world. And part of that means bringing comfort and, and doing what we can to uh, alleviate poverty and, alleviate, and heal diseases and do all those things that Christians have done over the years. So so being in connected to a community of faith, a healthy community of faith can be huge. But I would say something else, and I wish I I wish I had it out on my fingertips, but there's a, a wonderful passage from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And he said uh, he's consoling one of his friends who lost someone very close to him. And he said, uh, God will never fill that hole. That hole, that hole belongs to the close relationship that you had. And that hole is a reminder of it. And the phrase, the more I think about it, I think grief is the place where, where love and pain come together. The pain we feel is a direct ratio to the love that we felt. So you, you, I mentioned the, my, the mass shootings we tend to have in the United States. Those people feel no love. Mm -hmm. They just kill strangers like the school children. They don't feel grief. And we think, this is so horrible. And compare that to what the parents feel. And when you lose someone close to you like that, you can't say, okay, God, would you just take away that vacuum? No, <laughs> that vacuum is important. It's a, it's a, a hallmark of of the love that you felt, of the relationship that you had. So there's, I mean, I wouldn't use a phrase like sweet grief, but there's a there's a valuable grief and an appropriate grief uh, that that sh just expresses how important that person was to your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I I think that's exactly right. I mean, I have I have felt at times, uh, you know, when I was in the deep pits, like you were worth this, <laughs> you know, mm, that my husband yeah. was worth this, this horrible sorrow. I have, um, as any Christian who has gone through grief, I assume has experienced this sort of dumb things people say <laughs> yeah, right. trend. Um, but there's something deeper and theological that I keep hitting my head against, which is almost an implication that, um, that because we are growing through it inevitably, we grow through our pain and our suffering, uh, that that was the intention of it, that almost this subtle little message that God planned this so that we could all learn big lessons. Mm, yeah. And I keep tripping over that. And I wondered if you could respond to that. Yeah, I, I would say uh, there, there are two mistakes that, quote, Job's comforters <laughs> can make their modern day form. The first mistake is coming up with these easy answers. Mm -hmm. uh, we give Job's friends a hard time, rightly so, because it turns out they were completely wrong. But actually, they were his friends when they showed up. They were so shocked by what happened that they tore their clothes, put ashes on their head, and sat in silence for seven days and nights. And that's where the Jewish practice of sitting shiva comes from. When, when someone is grieving, you just go and sit with them and 
forcibly feed them, you know, to make them keep going. But you don't say anything. And Job's friends uh, were the first to do that. That was very helpful and comforting. It's when they opened their mouths that the problem was started. <laughs> <Yes>. Yeah, because <laughs> that showing up was is actually beautiful. I mean, I right. I do read Job a little differently now. It's yeah. like, wow, they yeah. they entered in to the cave of sorrow. They were brave, but yeah, then they started to talk. They did. Then they started to talk, <laughs> and they came up with the with a rational response. Job, uh, to, for anybody who's gone through this series of calamities, you must have done something terribly wrong. And they say that over and over in different ways. And Job cries out and says, I, I know that's not true, that I did not, I don't deserve this. And there's a lovely twist at the end of the book where God says uh, to the friends, I'm not even going to listen to your prayers unless you go through my servant Job. <laughs> yeah. And Job was honest. I mean, that's mm. he got a lot of things wrong. But he was honest and raw, and he told God exactly how he felt. And God respects that. And, and I encourage people, you know, don't shy away from expressing your outrage even to God. So that's, that's the first thing when we open our mouths and we come up with these crazy ideas. And, and the second thing is exactly what you said, that uh, uh, God, is, God has arranged this so that uh, it's for your own growth or the growth of the community around you. You can demonstrate to them a way to handle suffering and, and, and people can learn. And I would put it this way. I, I think it, it is true. I, I use this statement that redeemed pain impresses me more than pain removed. Pain redeemed mm -hmm. impresses me more than pain removed. Of the people I've interviewed over the years as a journalist, many involving suffering, the ones that stand out to me are people who didn't have their problem solved, uh, like a Johnny Erickson Tata, you know, who has been paralyzed for uh, more than 50 years now. And um, she tried so desperately, Billy Graham and Catherine Kuhlman and Oral Roberts, all these people anointed her with oil and prayed for her and and believed that she would be healed, but she wasn't healed and isn't healed to this day. And besides her quadriplegia, she's had a bad case of COVID. She's had breast cancer. She's had a tough life physically. And, and yet, my goodness, talk about redeemed pain. She took her infirmity, which seemed impossible to redeem when it happened to her. Young Olympic athlete, now unable to move. And she turned it into a, this beautiful ministry that helps disabled people around the world. And I would say, if you if you try to look backwards, okay, God look, God looks at you and says, "Oh, I know what I'll do. I'll I'll give you this infirmity, and then you can uh, figure out how to redeem it." it doesn't work that way. I, it, it's more. Yeah. I, I think of God as as the recycler <laughs> okay. who takes our junk. You know, not our not stuff that he designed for us, but God takes the, the bad stuff, the stuff we don't want, the stuff we want to throw away and somehow redeems it by making something worthwhile. And I think that's Paul's point in Romans 8. All the way through, he talks about the whole creation groaning and travail. You know, this is a planet-wide problem, the problem of pain. And then he talks about some of his own suffering and he had plenty from shipwreck and torture and snake bite and, and imprisonment and beatings and all these things. And yet he, he said, looking back in all of these things, God worked good in me. God worked mm -hmm. for, for my good. And you think, oh, really, Paul? I mean, it's not, he doesn't say, I'm glad I had all those things, but he said, God can take the worst that is thrown us and somehow with our cooperation work for our good. And um, I think that's God's style. He takes whatever happens and somehow finds something redemptive about it. So you take, what is the worst thing that could possibly happen? Oh, I know. That would be God coming to earth, becoming a human being, and having people murder him in the most brutal fashion possible, the cross. And we remember that as a day we called Good Friday, mm -hmm. not Bad Friday, Terrible Friday. It was Awful Friday. But God took that 
it looked like the end of everything and turned it into the salvation of everything. And, and I think that's, that's the pattern we see. That's why we wear crosses. People wear crosses around their neck. It's, it's the symbol that God can take this, this symbol of execution and brutality and death and somehow redeem it and, and work something good. And we do believe, we Christians believe that, that God will continue that process of recycling and making good out of bad all the way through the restoration of all things. And that's our hope that we cling to. But it, it does take faith. And, and besides that, even in this life, God can take those bad things and use them for our own good. Mm-hmm. Thank you. And that, that is such a precious and important nuance that uh, we can cooperate with God in the redemption of this awfulness, Mm -hmm. but that God didn't send that awfulness (laughs) in order for us to become more patient or something. And I I think that is so, uh, so important to be able to, you know, think through to that spot. And you talked about our cooperation with God in that. And I'd love for you to dig into that a little bit. And mm-hmm. our family, myself and our three children, we've we've talked about that, that we cannot waste this suffering. Like that's the phrase we've used. And that that's Brent good. would not, he would not want us to do that. Like he had tragedy in his life. And I think that was partly led to his, you know, calling to become a an Anglican priest. And Mm. we saw it in his life, how he used um, tragedy. He cooperated with God and, and that's what we want to do. But I see that it is a continual choice that it's not um, again, it's not this magical transformation that happens. We have to cooperate in the uh, walk to becoming more beautiful and not more bitter. And Mm -hmm. how do we do that? Well, Philip? Yeah. Well, I'll, I've had, I have my own uh, beginnings of trying to answer that question in my own life. I've lived a fairly healthy life physically. There were a lot of wounds from childhood and from church mm-hmm. that I've had to work through, and I wrote about them in a memoir. And actually, that was a good way to kind of tame some of those things that were floating around. So, uh, you might want to write a memoir. You know, you might want to. I find that for me, at least, writing is my way of metabolizing and making sense out of things that happen. But in this year, 2023, I also received an unexpected diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, and immediately people started telling me about all their relatives who have Parkinson's, and it's not a pretty picture. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and. It varies a lot. There are some people who have relatively mild cases or slow growing cases. And then there are others who, in a very short term of time, period of time, become almost immobile and, and uh, have dementia and, and some other things. So, yeah, it's a shock when you, when you get something like that. And one of the first things I noticed, Karen, is, is my compassion for other people. I, I took an airplane trip like days after I got this diagnosis. And there was a man in first class who I think had Parkinson's, had all the symptoms of it. And he was fumbling around trying to get his suitcase out of the overhead bin. And people, you know, these businessmen and women are backed up behind me kind of muttering about him. Why why isn't the line moving? And he drops things a few times and falls back into his seat. And, And my first thought was, that could be me in a short period of time. And the second thought was, I just need to be more sensitive to and caring for people like that. Uh, I, because it could be me, you know, Mm -hmm. we tend to think of them as an entirely different class of persons. And then suddenly I may be one of those persons. So I'm, I'm trying to think, how can I redeem it quickly? I also got an invitation to speak at an Easter seals camp, Easter seals, got its birth back when polio was a big disease. And and so my father uh, was, as a polio victim, was very aware of some of their care. And there's now a syndrome called post-polio survivors. And these are people who went through polio as children and then uh, uh, survived and 
maybe they had crutches or braces or something like that, but they went ahead and lived fruitful lives. And then in their late 60s or 70s, they started getting the symptoms of polio all over again. Well, in the meantime, it, it's hard to find a doctor who's ever seen a polio patient before. <laughs> you know, this was 50 years ago. And so they don't get good treatment. People don't know what to do about it. There aren't any studies about it. And they invited me to come and speak to them. So immediately I accepted just a small group of 25, 30 people, most of them in wheelchairs and crutches. And they told me their stories. And person after person said uh, that, well, I'll tell you one specific boy. When he was a boy, he was seven years old and he came down with with a case of polio, Was had trouble walking. So his mother found where there was some treatment. She went on a train with him to St. Louis, Missouri. And he thought, she told him he's going on a holiday. Oh, vacation, this is great. So they go to this big red brick building, which he presumes is a hotel. And she takes him to this room and said, this is your room. So uh, I'll see you later. And she walks out the door. And he sits there and waits and waits and nothing happens. And after 45 minutes or so, he looks out the window and he sees her walking away. And he didn't hear from her for the next three years. Oh, my god. This little seven-year-old boy. Because she didn't know how to cope with it. And then uh, he told of, uh, he took Mm -hmm. some negative strides. He became kind of rebellious and hurt. And then he decided, I'm not going down that route. So he Mm -hmm. set his, his sights on the Paralympics. Mm. And he worked out and worked out and eventually became a world-class sprinter in the Paralympics. And he told these stories, story after story, of what he had to overcome. And then at the end, he said, but, you know, looking back, polio added more to my life than it took away. Wow. And I stopped him. I said, that is quite a statement. Can you really say that polio added more to your life than it took away? And he said, Absolutely. And, and that was the same message I heard when I first, uh, or when I've interviewed Johnny Erickson Tata over the years, because we've become friends. And she says, if, if I hadn't had that accident, I would have been probably just a typical suburban mom driving a van with a couple kids and, and using my afternoons to ride horses because she loved horses, you know, and, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, but God gave me something more. God gave me a calling. He called me to a prophetic role. She didn't use those words, but I would. Mm -hmm. A truly prophetic role to remind us uh, of disabilities and and how we in the church should be reaching out to them. So I would never say that God chose that young boy at seven or Johnny Erickson at 17 and I'll show them or I'll teach them a lesson. No, but God can take no matter what happens and somehow with our cooperation. And it does, yes. it does take spirit. It, it may take a lot of therapy, <laughs> not just physical yeah. therapy, but emotional therapy <laughs> and, true. and a good family and a community. And, and that's part of what the, we in the church should be looking for. What role can we play? There were a few people and a few men in the church where I grew up who knew we had no father, my brother and I, and, they would invite us over and try to teach us how to play tennis or something like that, you know, mm-hmm. how, how to uh, tie a tie a bow tie, you know, or a necktie. My mother certainly didn't know, and that's the kind of thing you, your father teaches you. And there were a few people like that, and and they were all out of the church. Um, and that's one of the things we in the church can be sensitive to. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, when people show up, it is a beautiful thing. And when you were talking about your memoir, which I really, really enjoyed, I thought about the power of vulnerability and transparency and telling our stories because we are, um, you know, we are living testimonies of of like, and I mean the big, the big we of resiliency, of endurance, of, you know, yeah, God's uh, ability to help us, um, you know, keep living and, Mm -hmm. and keep going when things uh, turn so badly. And I I love the example of Johnny Erickson Tata. And I I remember, you know, as a young woman being so inspired by her story. So you're right, there's incredible power in that. Um, And again, people showing up, like just this afternoon, in fact, a couple of, you know, men from our church are coming to 
help me fix some things around my house. And just that kind of practical help has been so, so good. And I'm wondering as we uh, begin to wrap up, um, what have you learned about being present with those who grieve? And how do you hope people will show up for you as you live with Parkinson's? And hopefully it won't get, you know, hopefully you won't be a worst case scenario story, but how do we help? And how do you hope people will show up for you if you do need that? Hmm. I live in a duplex, so we share a wall. And and the other side of the wall, there was a a 98-year-old World War II vet. And finally, although he's he's stayed in his house alone since his wife died, uh, he actually buried three different wives over the years. And um, and his most recent one died about a year and a half ago. And they, he tried to stay in the house, but he has his own issues. He's got some cancer and some other things and needs needs care. And they brought in nursing care, but finally the family just couldn't cover all the bases. And so they, uh, much to their regret, had to put him in a, in a care facility where he had round-the-clock care. And uh, we visited him yesterday in his, in his new home, and it was pretty tough for him. I mean, here he survived the war, World War II. Yeah. And uh, he's a tough guy. And just to give up living on his own, admitting I need help every day, it's mm-hmm. not an easy thing. Mm-hmm. And and my wife was a hospice chaplain and worked in, in senior living situations before. And uh, we like to say to each other, the currency in a place like that is is not your bank account. Mm-hmm. The currency is the number of your visitors. That's really what counts. You're sitting yes. around the table, and there are some people who haven't had a visitor in months. Mm. And our friend, uh, our neighbor, he's the kind of person who has invested in others, and he'll have no problem with visitors. And that's that's what we can do. We can we can show up. We can be there, and and then we can. Um, we can offer the kind of practical help that you talk about. There's a there's an organization here in Denver called Hands of the Carpenter, and they get uh, men primarily who have certain skills in exactly what you said, <laughs> repairing mm-hmm. things around the house and fixing things, and they find uh, needy single mothers, in some cases widows, in some cases unmarried, and and then the more they worked at that, they realized their real need is an automobile because you have to have a car in most places in in Denver to have a job. We don't have great public transportation. So they started a branch where they repair cars free of charge. And they get these men who are good mechanics and they will keep your car running. And then they started accepting donated cars. And it became this pretty large organization with people in my church. Mm, I love Uh, that. That's so cool. Yeah. The practical needs, or there was another guy in my church, it's a small church, less than 50 people, but he had had polio and still uses crutches. And he found he could always get new crutches because everybody's got one in their attic somewhere when they sprain their ankle, you know, in the fourth grade or something. <laughs> so he, he started this thing called Crutches for Africa. And mm-hmm. he, was, he just goes around and gets not just crutches, but wheelchairs and and uh, these things you kneel on that have wheels on them and started sending. And now he sends these container ship full, full of uh, crutches to these places in Africa where we've seen the videos and he's seen them in person where usually a, a child or even an adult who can't walk is put on a cardboard piece of cardboard and just dragged around. And suddenly, boom, they're in a wheelchair and, mm. and they've got a kind of mobility that they've never had before. So that kind of responsiveness to the real need that's there, but but so much of it uh, actually boils down to a kind of loneliness. Yes, people are lonely in their grief. They don't want to be a burden, and and so they don't express. They don't. They don't express their vulnerability. Mm-hmm. But we're we are objects of God's grace, mm-hmm. and Jesus said when when. That when you're here, 
why would you do something like love your enemies? Why would you do something like care for people you don't know? Because that's the way God treats you, <laughs> us. <laughs> because God causes the rain to fall and the sun to shine on the good people and the bad people alike. And he said, and and it's not easy to go to nursing homes. It's not easy to look for people who take too much time, talk too long, you know. There's a certain cost, but look at the cost that God has shown us. And the only way the world will know that God is if we show what God is like in our own ways of treating people around us. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that is beautiful. Philip, what can we expect from you in the next little while? I know that you were doing a, a I think there's a rabbit room project coming right. out soon, which I have ordered, but I haven't gotten it okay. yet. I love yeah, the rabbit good. room. Yeah, they're wonderful. I just came back from their annual conference called Hutchmoot. <laughs> Such a great <laughs> I don't know name. where that word comes from, but <laughs> yes. Um, uh, for years, one of the books that has been most helpful to me in understanding pain is the book Devotions Upon Emergent Occasions by John Dunn. Terrible title, boring. Devotions <laughs> Upon Emergent Occasions. But, you know, this was written in 1623, so 400 years oh, wow. ago. It's never been out of print. And it's Amazing. the kind of thing you still study in high school. Uh, no man is an island. Ask not for whom the bell tolls. The bell tolls for you. You know, these they're part of the everybody's vocabulary in a way. And... You talk about uh, a person who is trying to make sense of the world. Here's John Dunn, and I won't go into his life right now, but um, he finally got the job of his dreams. He was the vicar, the pastor of the largest church in all of England, St. Paul's Cathedral, St. Mm -hmm. Paul's Cathedral. And it was at a time of a pandemic, far worse than the one we just lived through with coronavirus, the bubonic plague that killed one third of London and about another third fled to go into the country where they thought the air was safer. And here's John Dunn, and he was assigned to bring comfort to the people who were left, the one-third of London. And, and he was a great orator, preacher. So St. Paul's was packed from people just hungry for some sort of comfort, some sort of meaning with what was going on. And then John Dunn fell ill. And they assumed that it was the bubonic plague and that he was going to die. So for the next six weeks, he lay in bed and he could hear the bells tolling for other people who had died. And he wondered, are they really tolling for me? You know, do they know something they haven't told me yet that I'm about to die? And and he felt put a, put on the shelf because here he, he had a an important job at an important time. And now he's he couldn't do it. He's just lying there trying to recover. And medicine in those days made it worse. They would bleed you and apply pigeons to your mouth to draw away the vapors and crazy stuff like that. But he took that time, talk about redeeming pain, to write a series of devotions where he is just flat out wrestling with God. It's like Job part two. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. And he's one of the great uh, poets and, mm -hmm. and um, pro stylists of, of all time. His books are always in the top 100 books ever written in the English language. So he, he wrestled with God. And 400 years later, I've never found a book that is more apropos to somebody with those questions, trying to figure out those questions and the answers to them. Why me? And what can I learn? And what is God trying to tell me? John Donne is so profound because he's, He's got that great mind. And, and the interesting thing is, here we are 400 years later, we're asking the same questions. Yes, yeah. But um, a lot of people have trouble reading it because it was written in 1623, about the same time as the King James Bible, 1611. And he, had, he has one sentence in there, I counted, it has 234 words. Wow. And then that's there's this a weird, paragraph. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> or a page. And, and, and then there's this, there's the weird stuff, the weird science. So I did an updating. I mean, I I just wanted people to read this, to have wow. access to it, the wisdom. So I went through and and forgive me 
Dr. Dunn, one of the great stylists, and just made it more accessible to a 21st century reader in the middle of the pandemic. That was my pandemic offering, uh, trying to trying to come up with some some words of wisdom, some advice from uh, John Dunn. So that what book is called project. Undone, Undone, okay. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> which good. is appropriate. He, yeah, uh, yeah his, his father-in-law didn't like him. So he broke the marriage apart and put John Dunn in jail, in prison, to try to get him away from his daughter. Wow. And John Dunn wrote his shortest poem that goes like this. John Dunn and Dunn undone. <laughs> <laughs> what and, a great story. Yeah. So it, it is uh, one of the great works of literature. It's the 400th anniversary and that's, that's my offering. Wow. Uh, I, I, I tell you what, Karen, it is so much easier to start with one of the great yeah. authors of all time than to start with a blank computer screen. You know? <laughs> I believe it. I believe it. Yeah, wow. What a privilege. I, what a privilege it, it for was. you to do I, that. I felt oh honored goodness. to do that. And, yeah. uh, and people are reading it. Whereas they almost never read the, the old copy I would give out with the 200 word sentences. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, that is great. Well, I, as I say, I've ordered it and I will look forward to dipping in, but Philip, thank you so, so much for, once again, like just being willing to ask the hard, hard things and, and helping people think through it. Yeah, mm -hmm. think through it. It's an incredible ministry and we all thank you. I appreciate that, Karen. And you mentioned the rabbit room. Let me give one last word of uh, yeah. recommendation for your readers and listeners. Um, they, they have published this remarkable series called Every Moment Holy. Mm, yes. Every Moment Holy. And the first volume deals with all sorts of things, a liturgy for cleaning your gutters, for changing diapers, for washing the dishes, you know. The second volume focuses on suffering and grief. Mm -hmm. And it's a series of prayers. And one of the things I love about Psalms, and this only continues that, is that sometimes when you're going through a hard time and, and you're grieving particularly, you, you run out of words. You, yeah. you just don't, it's a blank. What can I say? And the Psalms are our prayer book. We can turn into that. And, and this kind of updates the Psalms. It, it applies some of the same principles to 21st century uh, practicality. So that's a, that's a book that some of your listeners may really find helpful as they're processing their own grief. The beautiful thing is God gives us words. He doesn't say, don't you fight back at me. He said, let me have it. I can handle it. I'll give you the words to use if you don't have those words. And that's what yeah. the book of Psalms is. Yeah, that is, that is so good and helpful. And uh, I, again, when we were walking through our darkest days, I had a friend sending me prayers from that book. And mm. I, I was blown away. It's like someone, someone is saying what I am feeling and it was yes. beautiful. And it, you know, it makes me think of the, the role of the artists, the role of the writers, mm. the role of the poets. It's so important in the church. They, they do wrap words around things that help point us toward God. Right. Right. It's a beautiful thing. Well, bless you in your own grief. Uh, Thank you. What Philip. we're doing right now is a way you're helping yeah. redeem a bad thing, recycle a bad thing. God is using it. And I I hope uh, listeners will pick up some of these resources that have helped us, you and mm -hmm. helped me. And, um, and, and I, you know, grief should come with a warning label. Do not practice this alone. <laughs> you know? Oh, you're, you're right. You are right. Thank you.